to defend the gospel. Gospel, yeah. Fighting to defend the gospel, yeah. Fighting to defend the Bible, yeah. As yeah. Christians, as believers. So, yes, our modern school system is built on a theory that drives away all logical reason, reasoning that leads a creature back to his creator. Um, i.e., you know, you know, uh, Charles Darwin wasn't even born yet <clears throat> by the time the Prussian, the Prussian uh, movement began, began to really seep into uh, the world. Um, so the point is, once it got in our, in our, once our faculties started, you know, bringing in a curriculum of, you know, evolution theory and all these other theories of our origins, uh, we realized that uh you know what the goal is also spiritual to drive uh mankind away from god and into his own uh place where he can justify himself and so that's that's one thing we are we understand we're up against uh see the world justifies what they can't understand with the material biological and theoretical answer so in other words like with the theory of evolution, the, instead of explaining the origins of mankind, you have to, in, the, in that theory, you have to add more years. You have to add years to justify why you can't explain what it is. So in other words, since no one was there, we can't, all we, if we just add a couple million more years to it it, 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 it gives us an opportunity to not have to take account for uh, anything. We just, we just exist. We don't have to answer that. That was millions and millions of years ago. And that's, that's why the millions of years, uh, language is, is, inf is infiltrated into biological studies, which, you know, carbon dating, they don't even have a method of carbon dating. They just say, look, if you look at it, you look at an object, you can determine how old it is, by putting it, you know, bringing it out of its original environment and putting it into a lab. And let's just say, mm, uh, let's just add a few more billions of years to it just that way, because we can't actually understand why there's water, there's evidence of water on the top of mountains. When we know there were no, you know, in their system, no flood ever, no, no flood, there was never any, any worldwide flood. So the fact that there's fish on the top of mountains you know, uh, and on top of canyons, you know, why these canyons run so deep and why they seem so new and fresh, let's just, let's just not examine that and let's just say millions of years ago, things were different. <laughs> so we're in that, we're in that environment, but rest assured, believer, the Christian explains what he understands based on the author of time, space, and matter. Our science starts with, in the beginning, God created. In the beginning, that's time. Uh, uh, in the beginning, God, he's the, he's the one who created uh, the space and the matter is, is, is what he made, what he spoke into existence. So we have our time, space, and matter all, all, all tucked in neat. We understand. Um, so in the world can only su suppress what they don't know. Like we just said, they have to add years or they have to put something in God's place. It's almost as silly as this. In a nutshell, with a bunch of long words, <laughs> the world will try to say, hey, look, God doesn't exist, but something just like God exists. You know, but it's not him though, it's something else. They will go with the, ultimately that's their, that's their philosophy. Um, and so they suppress and that's what happens with the, with the natural man. That's why we are depraved. That's why we are naturally foolish and futile in our thoughts because we don't want to submit ourselves to an authority outside of ourselves. Uh, but uh, unless a man accepts God's revelation, he will always accept what he alone can reveal. So if, 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 if I can't reveal it, God definitely can't reveal it. That's the world's position. And so our response to that is, look, you can lie and not live, but you can't live a 
lie. You can lie and not live. You can, you can lie and be as dead in your trespasses and sins as ever while you're drinking, smoking, partying, hanging out, doing whatever you want to do, having a bunch of fun. But you can't call it life until you know the life giver, and that's God himself. And you can't have truth until you know the truth giver, and that's God himself. God is truth. So you can lie, but you can't live in lie. You, you, can, you, 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 you can't live in lie. Um, and then the nature of truth exposes what's false. So that's our unique position. So while we, while we, while we're looking at these things, and it may it may trouble us and trouble me. I'll be honest; it's been troubling me for some years now. There's still a great a great news, a great attitude that we should have because our position is that of a person who has the truth before we uh, speculate about anything else. Uh, where are we in our homeschool education system? So right now. And this is just a few stats here. Homeschool, uh, uh, homeschool educates around 2 million students, or about 3.5% three, three of students in the U.S. Uh, while the percentage of non-religious students is on the rise, the overwhelming majority of today's homeschool students are in Christian families who want their children to have a Christian education, either through homeschooling or private Christian schools. Um, in 2012, there was an estimated 1.8 million homeschool students in the United States. As of last year, pre-COVID, at pre-COVID, uh, it was up to 2.8 million. So it, it, it actually doubled. Um, and uh, so um, there's been increases. Obviously, after COVID, it's, it's just convoluted numbers at this point. Everybody's technically homeschooled. Then you're going to have the virtual school versus you know, the non-virtual school. It's gonna be a bunch of weird data <laughs> next year. Um, but the idea of homeschooling and Christian education is not new. Uh, until the 19th century in the US, homeschooling was common and most students received a Christian education. That's a lot of times why people consider us to have a Christian nation. Um, it's not so much that we had a Christian nation and on a top-down perspective. It was a culture, it was a culture of Christianity that was a lot more prominent in the early goings or the early start of our uh, of our uh, our country, um, and so in the late nineteenth century and early twentieth centuries, states started passing compulsory schooling uh, laws, attendance laws, and you know uh, we'll talk about John Dewey a little later. So I want us to bank on what we learned from last week, catch up a little bit, and then we're gonna. We are first education reformers. So we talked a little bit, we left off last week on the medieval times. I'm not going to continue on that long drawn out, uh, I'm not going to take, it's not going to be a long drawn out thing. I just wanted to kind of give us a idea of where we are. Education in the middle medieval period was the prerogative of the church, the Roman Catholic church. And so after the fall of the Roman Western, uh, the Western Roman Empire, it was under the Frankish rule of Charlemagne. And uh, he concerted a campaign to begin the education of, to, of all people. So beginning in the late eighth century, around the 700s, monasteries and cathedrals started establishing schools of their own where they would uh, educate young boys in a variety of sciences. And uh, most of their education consisted of learning the classics, the Greek and Roman subjects uh, and, uh, you know, learning how to read and um, religious education. The Roman Catholic influence, it was very influential uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, it was the church and its bishops and monks who continued learning and teaching classical subjects such as grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And as a result, Charlemagne sought to have his subjects educated. Um, he had to return Okay, and, and uh, he, this remained the case, not just in France, but also elsewhere throughout Europe until the high Middle Ages going into the Renaissance era, of like 11, 1200s. The church uh, as primary patrons of the arts and education would remain the key institution, which was aided uh, by imparting, uh, imparting education in Middle, in Middle Europe. So all that sounds cool until we actually understand what's really going on. The first university in medieval Europe was established in Italy in 1088, right? 
but only 5% of the European population had any formal education by 1330. So if a peasant or serf family attended education, attained education without the permission of the nobility, they were fine. So it was almost a, almost a legal, very tight knit slavery when it came to formal education and race didn't have anything to do with it yet. But in comes the Protestant Reformation. Uh, on October 31st, what do we celebrate? Um, Halloween, not just playing. Uh, hallelujah, hall hallelujah, hallelujah night. Hallelujah night, yeah. <laughs> Trump, Trump a treat. Oh, oh yeah, chicken. Trump a treat. Yeah. Yeah, 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 all that, yeah. Well, in our Christian tradition, in our heritage, we actually also celebrate uh, what happened around 500 years ago, October 31st, 1517, when uh, Mr. Martin Luther, uh, the early reformer in the church, nailing in, in Germany, he nailed, in Germany of all places, <laughs> he, he nailed 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. Uh, the point was to debate the statements to bring about greater understanding of scripture and a greater adherence to what scripture taught. Now, mind you, this is after the print and press, no excuses. Access is not a problem. It's the allowing of access that's the problem because the church was sucking up all of the data. You got to come through us. If you don't have a priest, then you don't have a book. That's basically how, how, how that worked. Uh, the reformers reformed the church by the five solas. First of all, scripture alone, these are all Latin terms, sola scriptura, Christ alone, that's solus Christus, grace alone, that's sola gratia, faith alone, sola fide, and God God's, to God's glory alone, sole deo gloria. Uh, the first principles of scripture alone sparked a hunger for knowledge and a reformation, not only of the church, but of education as well. And so we're going to look at a breakdown of, of, of what they what they also stood for. And these solos, we're going to go over them this year at some point. If you have any questions about it, even in, even tonight, if you have some uh, some interesting idea or if you even want some more understanding about the solos, we can talk about it. All right. So the first education reformers were believers. They were Christians. The idea of importance of Christian education was firmly established by leaders of the Protestant Reformation. This is what we're talking about. Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, a few other people as well. Uh, the book, John Calvin, Theologian, Preacher, and Educator, and Statesman explains that Luther and Calvin both disagree with the medieval church's view that ignorance is the mother of piety. What this big slogan was, it was kind of like the hashtag of the day, basically, basically meant that if you are pious, meaning if you're someone that is that has a position in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, it's your, it's your, it's only in your hands that ignorance can be, uh, uh, can be done away with. You teach, you know, you, it's your, it's your, it's your world. Basically, um, if you're not working in the church as a leader or a priest, you're not, um, you're not going to be educated. That's, that's basically what that meant. And they, they taught, the reformers wanted to teach that every believer needs to be able to read and study the Bibles, Bible for themselves. Um, and they weren't just in, into literacy. It was, a, it, was, it was, again, like we talked about last week, they wanted to educate the whole person. And before the Reformation, education was a privilege mainly of the wealthy, aristocrats and priests, but the reformers argued that it should be made available to all. So they, they actually opened up schools themselves. They came from a little money and they used their money, they put their money to work. It wasn't just, you know, flashing money and coins. They said, we're going to put this money to work. We're going to make sure that people are educated and we're going to educate girls because women were the ones that were pretty much the outcasts at this point. And they saw the importance of developing the potential of every child for the glory of God. And the later reformers like John Calvin opened the way for people to raise themselves by education and be diligent uh, in use of their knowledge and ability. Um, Calvin also opened up a, uh, a one of the first um, hospitals, uh, you know, and so he, he wanted not just to reform education, but also healthcare. So that's, that's a, that's another subject, but there's a lot of great things that God has done and used 
in, during, the, during the Protestant Reformation. A lot of people may hear Protestant Reformation and all they hear is, or think of is the, the, you know, this this old monk guy that's snailing some something, some papers to a, to a door. But it's, it's way bigger than that. It's a reform on all levels. And they also believe in responsibility in the home. So the reformers believe that the primary responsibility of educating children fell upon the church and parents. Okay, and Luther personally started numerous schools in existing churches. So where we get private schools and private um, Christian schools, it started, started here in the 1500s with, uh, with uh, Martin Luther. He personally started a num numerous schools in existing churches. Congregations were expected to provide the funding. Okay, so basically you give on Sunday, you're not just giving for a building fund. <laughs> you're giving, you're giving also for the, the education uh, responsibility of, you know, to help the parents for the kids so they can have a, the, they can get the books because books always cost, especially when we're talking about just a hundred, two, three hundred years. It's only been that we've actually had available books. It's not, that's not a long time. Our parents were expected to play an important role, not only in making sure the children attended class, but reinforcing instruction at home. Church leaders would shepherd the, the instruction process, and they have weekly meetings with the students. Yeah, so that's your, that's your first Christian PTA. Um, doctrine and practice, uh, they believe in, in the content of what we're, what we're learning is that God is sovereign over all creation. So that means you can study anything in a God-centered uh, mindset and it, and it opens that thing up to the greatest possibilities. So like uh, in this book from Jacob Hoekstra, he says, there is not a single fact in the universe that God is not, uh, that is not a God-centered fact. All facts derive from their significance and meaning from a mind of God. And uh, so they believe that. And, and so that means there's, there's a biblical understanding first as the foundation, but now we can look at science in a great way. Now we can look at botany, we can study the plants. We can, it, it's a beautiful experience. It's not just where does this come from? It's look at what God made. And it, it makes it even a, a greater education experience. They cared about teachers. The reformers saw the job of uh, the teacher as extremely important. They, wanted, they viewed teachers as officers and servants of the church. And they require that they not only be trained in the subjects like we know of today, but also they would get a degree in theology. So they would be a mature and good character. They also argued that the teacher's pay, the teacher's pay should be generous enough to allow for poor children in their classroom who cannot afford to pay their schooling. So before this whole tuition stuff came to play, teachers were sponsoring children. You know, so the, the, the church was financing the schools. The parents were instrumental in the, ch in the child's life for their education at home. And the teachers were paid handsomely enough to be able to afford the, some of the poorest students. So it, it really, it really covered everybody. No one was out of, without excuse because they were, they were part of that Acts 2 mentality uh, or Acts 4 mentality of making sure that everybody understood that we're all in this together. And again, I just, I mentioned earlier, John Calvin, he started the Geneva Academy, which become the model for colleges and universities for hundreds of years, even today. The Geneva Academy is still, is still alive now. Uh, the Academy was a university that offered higher learning in several subjects, including theology, training pastors, and those preparing for other vocations, the school saw law as well, uh, lawyers as well. The law, uh, the school also saw their job as raising up those who would be prepared to serve in the church and in government. So there's a lot of things that we can thank God for here. But we have to get back to how we got our modern education in the modern world going into America. So what I want to do here is for a quick moment. Uh, first, ask questions. See if you had any. If, if you learned anything so far, if uh, if you know, if you want to praise God real quick, or if you want to just acknowledge that, hey, you know what? I I, I never heard this before. 
I, you know, just let me know. You know, um, just what you said as far as like how teachers, you know, they, I don't know, what, did they make enough to where they could do it or was that something that the reformers wanted? Like, well, did that um, happen? <laughs> because, like, I'm under the mindset, like, the modern day educational system, not just school, but I'm just saying, like, college, it's a hustle. It's like, I can't, yeah. I can't call it no other way. You sit back and you, you take these classes and it's like, you know, and then they charge you all this money. And then when you graduate, they're asking, do you have practical knowledge? And you don't. Right, right. Now, and see, it's a it's a complete difference here because let's just let's just let's go into this world real quick, real fast. Like, you go to church, and in your church, there are elders. You know, there's an opposite pastor. You know, there's there's children. There's all kind of people. Now, what you do is at offering time. You know, they want to explain. Look, we're trying to save up. Uh, to, to, to purchase a large um, curriculum of, of books, uh, whether that be some of the classics, as well as, you know, some good commentaries, because commentaries are being written uh, for our children, so we can grow them this week and, and, and make sure that, you know, they, they have what they need. That's said at church. So you give your money to, you know, you give your offering, your free will giving, to whatever the cause is in, in that regard. And those funds help not only run the, the church, but they help, uh, they help run the school. So basically it was self-funded. You know, it, it wasn't like, uh, you know, you had yeah. kids had to get a loan and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So yeah. we're paying for the teachers and we're paying for the, you know. Yeah, the yeah. I, I, I was saying, so if that's how it was, then, Man, that's cool, but when you when you look at today, yeah. you know, it's like you can't help but to think it's a hustle. And um, but I, I think that it's cool because it's like the giving was given not only to the church but to the community. And mm -hmm. in a way, like that's like real hardcore discipleship. You see what I'm saying? It is, it is it, it, it was sacrificial too. Yeah, you know, we had people, you know, I mean we <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> but there were there were people that went home to a couple loaves of bread, right? I mean, they're, they're, the sites were on bettering the community for young people to grow in their education. And a lot of times that means we're not going, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just a discipline. It's not a lot of distraction. It's a, it's a complete focus. I mean, they prayed on this every day. God provided. They worked. They did everything they had to do. And at the end, at the end, at the end of result is we're going to live a sacrificial life for the betterment of others. That's just biblical Christianity right there. If anybody yeah. else, uh, I see um, I see a few mutes went away. So anybody else got, you know, any comments? I'm just curious if there's a link to that video that you can somebody can send me so that I can share that with. Oh others. yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I can we we'll put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, you know, while we're while we're at it, we we we've got to move a little quicker just to get to this uh, some of these things here. But let's look at our modern world education. So. As a structure, we're just gonna kind of overview what's going on. So the learning objectives in schooling began with language, philosophy, art, and life within Greece, Rome, and ancient Africa. Those are the main centers of education. Now, what you may hear in public school is ancient Africa didn't really have much to do with it, but we're, we're, we're circumventing the whole conventional, conventional way of presenting history. When I research or when I help others research, it's, it's, it's to get the real storyline and 
if it takes a couple of months to get the information necessary, it's just, it's just going to take a couple of months. And, and that's, that's kind of what um, I just wanted to make sure you, you know, we understand. Egypt was a epicenter of education for a long time. And Greece copied a lot of Egypt. Egypt copied a lot of Greece. Um, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was a give and take there. So I just want to put that out there. Um, grammar schools, they were places of classical learning. Early America rested easily on classical understanding and antiquity with a major emphasis in reading. So before the whole revisionist history implementation and all of that, it's, it was just simply real raw learning um, from, from, the, from, the, from real resources. But what I want to do to get to how we're going to compare two free, uh, free education systems. Both of these are free. And the smartest people in here will be able to denote which free education did America adopt. There's two types of free education out there. One's a commercial and one's really free. <laughs> We're going to look at ancient Greece versus Sparta, or Athens, really. It's really Athens versus Sparta. Uh, for a long time, because they're both in Greece, for a long time, classical Athens distributed its most responsible public positions by lottery. Think about it. Your, your high-level positions in government, your high-level positions in service were done with a lottery system. Okay, so whether you're an army general or you're providing, or you're, or you're a head of water supply and agriculture, it's a lot of, it's a lot of. So what are the implications of a lottery? Well, there is an expectation that everyone has competence. There's an expectation or implication that professionals existed but did not make key decisions because they were only technicians. So no matter how good you are at a subject, if you're really good at one of those subjects, you're just, you're a technician. That's it. We don't need to listen. I'm, I just had a little slight, slight side step. We don't have to listen to an influential rapper talking about today on their stance on social issues. We don't really have to. We don't have to, but, but just because this person has a lot of money doesn't mean we have to listen to them. That's, that's, that's what ancient Greece was about. It's like, look, I don't care. You're a technician. You go rap. Go, you know, it, it literally like shut up and dribble. Like go, <laughs> go do your, you, you are good at this. Do it well. That was the, the mindset. Then. Now, some of that may be taken a, a little different way, but the point is this is the culture that we're talking about. Uh, the prevailing opinion is that, that, that technicians had enslaved their own minds. So if you were a specialist in one particular area, you weren't looked at as somebody that was like, wow, you know, we need to be like them. I mean, we need to get their autograph. It was more like, oh, they're just techs. They're technicians. They're actually a little weird because they don't expose their mind to other things. So anyone worthy of citizenship was expected to think clearly and welcome great responsibility. No boys and girls continuing in their youth under continuous instruction under the command of strangers. Everything was in-house. Nobody did homework in a modern sense or standardized test. The test came in living. Forced training was actually considered slavery. Free man learning was self-discipline, not the gift of experts. School means leisure. It actually, that's the original classical understanding of school. The etym etymology of it is it means leisure. And they would have leisure in a formal, in, in, in a, uh, in a formal garden to actually think and reflect. Imagine your actual classroom being in a very nice upscale garden versus a classroom as a child. I mean, we can't even, we can't even comprehend that. Plato was the one that, the one that kind of changed the definition that school is a learning discussion. So in Athens, uh, this was instruction. Instruction was actually unorganized, you know, uh, it just was unorganized. It was up to the person to grab from subjects and organize them himself. That's just, that's just how it was. Now, 500 years 
from Homer to Aristotle, and for 500 years, that, that was a system of education. Teachers flourished without a rigid curriculum, and study was his own reward. Now, let's go across the street and let's learn about Sparta. Sparta, and this is real short, straight to the point, we're not going to spend a long time on this. Society was formed by a cradle to grave formal training. So it's right out the gate. Once you, once, once you did your first burp, it's time to work. You're going to, be, you're going to be in formal training for the rest of your life. The whole state was a universal schoolhouse. The family was employed as a convenience for the state. The elite conducted state policy. The practical aspect of imitation democracy, imitation, not like, I'm talking about imitation crab, like not real democracy, like, you know, I don't want to step on toes, but I'm talking about when, when it says imitation democracy, this is like, uh, when you see these commercials, right? <laughs> Where one candidate is shaming the other one in the name of the good of the people or whatever, that's imitation democracy. Uh, imitation democracy follows, uh, follows strong and later social thinkers like Machiavelli and, and, and Hobbes. You know, these are, these, are, these are social thinkers that influence a lot of our ads that we have today that make us feel like, oh, that was good. You know what, I'm gonna vote for him. He sounds so good, you know? That, there's a science behind that. Um, Spartan ideals of management came to American consciousness. I, I guess I told it. I, we, 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 I, I kind of gave you the answer here. Um, Spartan ideals of management came to American consciousness to the classical studies and early schooling through churches and through the German military, German churches, uh, to the state of Prussia, which consciously modeled itself after Sparta. So Sparta inspired Germany or Prussia, which inspired the US. Uh, let's just give a brief history of, of, of this Prussia thing, because you know it didn't start off as bad as it looks. Um, it actually was, there was some biblical Christianity in Germany as well, in, in early Prussia. Um, but in order to dominate in, 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 uh, in military, there had to be a one sound, a one faith, a one people. And humility was just pretty much against the law <laughs> when it came down to building this Prussian empire. But real quick, under William II, Frederick the Great's nephew, Frederick the Great is the one who kind of instituted everything. He was the one that kind of, he wanted to make Prussia a, a power. Uh, his nephew actually did the work though. You know, yeah, one person that thought it, William actually did it. Uh, the Prussian citizens were deprived of all rights and privileges. Every existence was comprehensively subordinated to the purpose of the state. And in exchange, the state agreed to act as a good father this is in their documentation, in their constitution. We are the father of you, right? Uh, so they're the father. They gave food, they gave work, they gave wages, they gave welfare for the poor and the elderly, and universal schooling for children. And the early 19th century saw how Prussian, the Prussian state socialism arrived full blown as the most dynamic force in world affairs, a powerful rival to the industrial capitalism with antagonism sensed but not yet clearly identified. So in other, in other words, evil was working to the point where it was, it was pretty busy. And uh, because they're, you know, because the, the Reformation, everybody moved westward, the East was pretty much dominated by this Prussian model of understanding of, of, of government. Um, we already talked about it, you already saw the video. We saw that the seeds were planted in 1806. We learned about Gottlieb Feet uh, and, and all his stuff, you know, his, his big speech he made. He made the reform for, for Prussia. And we need to, you know, some of the things he said, if you want to know, um, he said that the party was over and that children would have to be disciplined through the universal conditioning and could no longer be trusted to their parents. Yes. Uh, the Prussian connection, again, the semantic redefinition laid the power to cloud men's minds uh, of, of this new new age, this new people, this this change, you know, this 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 champion of change. That's 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 their method of that's their tactics. If you want to know where slogans like, and I'm, I'm I promise you, this is just I'm just trying to give you facts. I have no skin in this game. I'm just strictly Christian. That's it. 
But the yes, we can slogan, the make America great again slogan, the uh, change slogan, the we shall overcome. So all these slogans are derived from a textbook context, a, a textbook info, infrastructure. Semantic redefinition laid power to the cloud, the, it clouds men's minds. This power was packaged and sold by public relations pioneers, Edward Bernays and Ivy Lee in the seed time of American forced schooling. Compulsion schools were not new, but they were not enforced. So the difference between compulsion schools that John Calvin and all the one and Prussia was that Prussia will put a knife to your throat if you didn't comply. So they, they rule by force, much like China. We haven't even talked about China yet, but China's, China's right here with them. This, this is nothing new. So let me give you their objectives. Let me give you their objectives. They want obedient soldiers in the army, obedient workers for the mines and the factories, well-subordinated civil servants, well-subordinated clerks, citizens who think alike on most issues. <laughs> National uniformity in thought, word, and deed. In thought, word, and deed. People, we're not talking about education. We're talking about a religion. They wanted people to worship the state. Thought, word, and deed. What does that sound like? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There was three types of schools. You already saw this in the video. There was a top tier school. This was the 1%, the master's college. Then you had the 5% the real college or the real university. This is where you have architects, doctors, engineers, you know, the managers. But look at the bottom tier, y'all. 92% of the population of children went to the bottom tier where they learned obedience, cooperation, correct attitudes, and revised history. <laughs> they learned revised history. This ran by in 1819 and promised liberal education for all Reading was discounted and not and not encouraged. So this leads us into today. Um, we're just going to skip down. Um, let me just give you a brief understanding about this. America, when we lost in the War of 1812, right, because we didn't get Canada, um, we barely had Detroit. We lost Detroit for a while, and some things happened. We signed some treaties. The point is, the War of 1812 was where America was fighting against the British on certain territories, right? It's basically in a nutshell. And because we lost and we didn't have any real clear direction at the particular time, uh, we were in, in trouble. And when people are vulnerable, they're gonna look to their master. <laughs> and the master of those who don't have Christ is the enemy, the enemy of Christ. So therefore, for the Prussian model of government was, was perfect. It was perfect. They had to get it. Traditional American school values like good manners, piety, intellectual tools, self-reliance, that was scrapped. That was scrapped. For the new commercial and manufacturing future, it made sense. So industry had to improve. If a world power was going to stay a world power, they needed to have a thriving workforce, machines, big things, big ideas, things that will allow for mass production. You don't need a bunch of thinkers anymore. We don't need a bunch of people that want to sit in a garden and learn and grow in wisdom. Like who wants to do that? No, we need people on the floor in the assembly line working. These are our subjects. And that's that's what we're running into here. And um, yeah, from the mid-century onward, certain uh, utopian scheme. It was, it was in the name of a utopia, a one world love, a one world religion, a, a, a world peace. World peace didn't come into play until the 60s when it really got, got very popular, but there was a utopian scheme the whole time. Um, there was some opposition here. Uh, I like Mr. Brown, uh, Brownson, I have some links about him. Uh, he was in opposition to Horace Mann, and he said, where the whole tendency of education is to create obedience, all teachers must be pliant tools of government, 
Such a system of education is not inconsistent with the theory of Prussian society, but the thing is wholly inadmissible here. He further argued that according to our theory, the people are wiser than the government. Here, the people do not look to government for light, for instruction, but the government looks to the people. That's how it's supposed to be, guys. That's what the Constitution is about. The government is supposed to serve the nation. It's not, the nation is not supposed to serve the government. But he goes on with this quote, and you know, you'll be able to see this in a, later on. We already talked about some of the reports. Um, the seventh report, it, he highlighted the tenth, but the seventh report was the one that Horace Mann, he, it was a travel report when he went over there. And let me give you some, let me give you an insight about Horace Mann, right? So he goes, he goes to Germany, he goes to Prussia, to an empty school, right? He didn't see anything taking place. He just, he just wrote in his mind that this was a, this was a paradise, you know, because everybody was so nice and everybody was so cool and so chill. And he didn't, he didn't even see what one class looked like. He didn't see the, the, the eyes of the children. He didn't see any of that. They were all on summer vacation. So he went, he went during the summers to get an idea of what the schooling would be like. So we're, this a pipe dream. <laughs> it's a, it's one man's pipe dream became the whole nation's, uh, you know, uh, subjugation. To, you know, we subjugated ourselves to a man's pipe dream. Um, yeah, so uh, also here in 1909, a well-coordinated attempt from industrialists and financiers to transfer power over money and interest rates from the elected representatives at the American people, of the American people, to, fe to a Federal Reserve, a centralized private banking interest. Uh, George Reynolds, the president of American Bankers Association, declared himself in the favor of a central bank that was modeled after the German Reichs Bank. So why is this even on here? Why is this even important? Well, once you centralize your, your schooling, it's a good idea to centralize your money. So that way you can hide your ideals behind schooling in a commercial and you can hide your money dealings uh, behind a commercial as well. So when it's sold to the American people through Bernays and, and Ivy Lee, we, we, we realize that, oh, so we have a centralized, we don't even say, don't even say centralized, we, we have a bank that, you know, prints our money and they keep, it, they keep, they keep control of our, our, our finances. Cool. You know, it's a good idea. But ultimately, the centralization of education begot the centralization of our finances. And so now people become a, a number rather than a person. And uh, that's a whole rabbit hole with the Federal Reserve. We're not even going to go down that tonight. Um, so the last thing before we get into like what's happening right now and, and as believers, how do we respond to this? Um, the University of Chicago, Howard C. Hill published The Life and Work of the Citizen. This became the foundation of our modern school system agenda provided by the Department of the Education, Department of Education of the United States. And if you just can see these pictures here, this picture at the top represents the united strength of science, trade, law, and order protecting civil life. So in other words, if you look at this picture, this is God, government, law, and industry all as one. They're all connected to the one. And, and at this, this post up at the top is an eagle. So this right here is a human version of a swastika. Our life and work of the citizen, our actual documentation that drove our education system was a Nazi-driven system in its content. They're trying to promote a one race, one culture, one world, one government, one people uh, without God. There's no Christ in this book, I promise you. <laughs> uh, so these are a few quotes before we before we finalize everything. 
Um, Woodrow Wilson, our 28th president, he's also the president in 1909 of the Princeton University. This man said, we want one class to have liberal education. <laughs> we want another class, a very much larger class of necessity to forego the privilege of liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific, difficult, manual tasks. And mind you, this man was probably the most racist president we have ever, we've ever had, period. There's a lot on Woodrow Wilson that gets swept under the rug. You know, uh, but this man, well, not only was he a racist, but he could care less even about race. He wanted, he wanted the working class to be anybody that didn't have as much money as his friends, period. John D. Rockefeller, a mogul. I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm just going to skip down here. He says, we have not to raise up from among them, talking about parents, authors, editors, poets, men of letters. We shall not search for embryo great, of great artists, for great artists, pop painters, musicians, nor lawyers, doctors, preachers, politicians, statesmen of whom we have an ample supply. The task we set before ourselves is very simple, as well as a very beautiful one, to train these people as we find them to, to a perfectly ideal life just where they are. So we will organize our children into a little community and teach them to do in a perfect way the things their fathers and mothers are doing in an imperfect way. This was a set of the General Education Board, which was owned by Rockefeller and, Car and Car Andrew Carnegie in 1913. Now, some of this is really crazy, right? Benjamin Kidd, he said, uh, and this is in 1917, there was a big meeting of the Rockefeller Foundation, Carnegie, Harvard, Stanford, University of Chicago, the National Education Association. Ben Kidd said, we want to impose on the young the ideal of subordination. Yankee entrepreneurship, entrepreneurialism should be extinguished at least among the common population. The capital investments that the industry require for equipment are not, were not justifiable. So because we have more equipment, Students ought to think of themselves as employees competing for the favor of management, not as Edison or Franklin uh, self-determined free agents. <laughs> Crazy. I mean, there's more. It, it, it keeps going, guys. But I want to I point, point out about overproduction. There's always a trigger word in the media. I'm just giving you propaganda lessons 101. There's trigger words in the media. You hear things on CNN or you hear things on Fox News. You hear things on your local news and there's a word that they may use. I remember, I don't know how old the oldest person is on here, but if you, and I'm not, I'm not that old myself, but I do remember after researching, looking at uh, the campaigns when Clinton and Ross Perot and George, uh, George W. Bush, George W. Bush Sr., when they were going, I mean, this is just a, a small sample size. It's been going on for centuries. But they had a, a common word that the media kept championing. And uh, it kind of lost me for a second of which, what it was. But they kept saying it over and over. I think, um, let's just go to something recent, guys. I don't want to go that far. Let's, let's go to 2000. All of us should have been born before 2000, <laughs> the year 2000. What was the big word that was all over the news and it tried to strike fear in the population? Terrorism. Terrorism. Yes. 2020. I mean, I'm not 2020, but uh, 20. I remember in the year uh, 1999, like everybody was like scared to death because we was going into year 2000. The Y2K, the Y2K, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, people was like, they were scared to go to church. They was just like, yeah, nah, bro. Up. Right, like, yeah. I don't know the word, but I know people, people was fearful at they the were. time. So. Yeah, but the age of terror, Tony brought out terror, and that terrorism was a huge moniker. It was, you know, we gotta fight against the terrorists, and 
we're so blinded by this word terrorism that we didn't realize that America was funding both sides of the war. Now, that's a whole nother conversation as well. But the point is, in the early 30s, the big trigger word, really, it was from 1880 to 1930, the, the trigger word was overproduction. Yeah. Oh, no, we don't want to have overproduction. You know, basically, it became the trigger word controlling metaphor among the managerial classes. So the idea of overproduction is, look, you know, it's a psychological campaign that had to be used in order to prevent the threat of overproduction. That's why we need mass schooling. That's why, because, you know, we already have too many smart people. We can't have too, we can't have many more smart people making decisions. We need people to be in social order. So we want to prevent overproduction. And when, 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 when the Great Depression happened, overproduction was the big old hashtag back then. You know, we got to prevent this overproduction, guys. So you got to find yourself an assembly line. You can't, you, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it just seemed like today, it's like that punchline is follow the science or the word science due yeah. to like Corona. Like, yeah, you know, the, you experts, politics, the experts, like, the right. experts is the science. Well, what does that mean? That's just like <laughs> such a, a, a vague and just out there slogan. Like, right. you know, he doesn't follow the science or the science say this. Like, I just feel like that's one of those words that you're referring to today. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. And hey, you're right on. Can I say right on Go ahead. Um, and to add to that, too, another word um, today, I think that um, has been a word for a while is progressivism. Um, progressivism and nowadays. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, nowadays, what? It's uh, uh, like collectivism and like, you know, we all got to come together and kumbaya and it takes a village and all that other stuff. Um, yeah. Would you put that yeah, in that I mean, category, too? Absolutely, absolutely. There's, there's certain terms that are to calm the masses. And one of those calming words, you know, you know, it's either calm or uproar the masses. It's almost like how Hitler, he would say a word for applause, and then he would say a word for everybody to shush. It's kind of like, it's a, it's a mind control, um, psychological established my, uh, uh, exercise. But now, because we have media, we have people in front of screens and all that, it's like, it's, it's easier to do that in a very subtle way. You don't have to like, it's easy, we could easily see it in the 1920s, right? Like, <laughs> you, it, people were still developing things, right? But now that we're kind of a machine, you know, you'll miss it. You'll miss it if you, if, you know, you, you'll look right at it and miss it. it it'd be right, it'll go right past you like, oh, oh, I didn't even hear him say that. So, I've been there, trust me. You know, this took this took years of conditioning my own self to realize, man, I gotta really read between the lines. But here's uh let's 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 look at our modern history real fast and then we can finally have a discussion. Um and uh we will be done it should be done around 8 30. 30 years later, between 1967 and 1974, this is very, very important. Teacher training in the U.S. was covertly revamped by coordinated efforts of a small number of private foundations, along with the select universities, global corporations, think tanks, and government agencies. Uh, look up the Tavis Stock Institute. Look up uh, the uh, look up Tavis Stock. Uh, there's a few others that uh, I'm missing right now, but I'll have it all for you. No worries. Um, uh, these think tanks. But the main agent, uh, agent to dis distribute the agenda was the U.S. Office of Education, along with the State of Education Departments in California, New York, Texas, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. So here were their milestones. Okay, here, here were their milestones. Number one, government exercise and futurology. Look up the book you'll see in Designing Education for the Future. This is the Precipice. This is the one of the uh, uh, 
magnum opus documents of the education of our education trust. If you look up education trust, they're going to have the design of education for the future, futurology. Education was redefined as a means to achieve important economic and social goals of national character. State agencies would serve as federal enforcers, ensuring compliance of local schools with centralized directives. Each state department would coin the objective as being an agent of change. People still say this today. Schools will lose individual identity and authority in order to form a partnership with the American government. So this is why you have, you don't just have the Board of Education, you also have the administration, you have an administrator of a school, there's different jobs. Like school became a jobs thing now. It's not just teachers that are looking after children and working with parents, it's administrators, public officials, heads of these, these private organizations that are coming in to make sure that kids, if they're acting out of character, we got to put them on Ritalin, or we have to we have to tax the parents. We have to let them know, look, you know, your your child is 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 eligible for expulsion. And guess what happens when you don't put your child in school? When your child isn't in school, I know you can't uh, afford a private school. I know. Um, uh, I, I I think I've heard that. Uh, there are some people who've been arrested, not in the United States, for like homeschooling their kids. Well, not, yeah, well, that, yeah, that, that's definitely happened. What I was saying is you can be considered a truant. The child needs to be in school. The parents get penalized for the child not being in school. And, and that's, that's what was part of this, uh, this future education system. Uh, number two, behavioral science. Teacher Education Project. Michigan State is the center of this. 1967, teaching reforms to enforce on the country after 1967 and personal, impersonal manipulation through schooling, few will be able to maintain control over their opinions. That was in the document. Each person at birth will receive a multi-purpose identification number for tracking behavior. China's already way ahead of this. They're already doing it, but this is basically uh, using your social security number for more than just, um, you know, registering your birth. It's literally an opportunity. Now we can implement their, their we can track their educational upbringing with their, with their social security number. And then they saw the chemical experimentation of minors, Ritalin. Uh, that was an intervention uh, in, uh, after 1967 as well. A small elite will control all important matters. One where participatory democracy will largely disappear. Postmodern schooling is to focus on pleasure cultivation and other attitudes and skills compatible with a non-work world. Schooling became a laboratory of psychological experiment. Uh, last is the Last is the, uh, it's a thousand page book. <laughs> it's the Taxonomy of Educational Objectives. It, and it came out in 1954. Um, this was by Benjamin Bloom. It was a tool to classify the ways of individuals are to act and feel as a result of instruction. So this is where like certain kids got put into special ed um, because of their attention spans and everything. It's kind of, kind of in concert with the behavioral science, but um, there was a documentation of how each child is supposed to respond to instruction. Crazy. Uh, this is why they, you know, sit down, raise your hand. If you have to go to the bathroom, here's a hall pass. All that stuff is, is a part of the, of the curriculum. Um, I don't have time to go over propaganda, but this book by Jacques, Il, El, El, Elio um, is, is, is huge. And uh, so let's just finally, as believers, just calm down. Let's get back to the real. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot. It's, I'll tell you, it's a long rabbit hole. You can really have a lot of fun or a lot of despair looking at. But um, what is an educated person? What is this whole project about, guys? What is an educated person? It's an encouraged reader. It's a critical thinker an active listener, 
and a person with a desire to seek wisdom and knowledge beyond his own opinions. That's it, guys. It is not a person with a bunch of degrees, though they can have some if they, if they choose to. It, we have to realize that our education is not about going to school. It's about seeking wisdom and knowledge beyond our own opinions. Now, how, what's a well-educated person? is one whose desire is to seek wisdom and knowledge, not only beyond his opinion, but beyond the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's a, that, that person can only be educated in the will of God by way of the Holy Spirit. So what do we do? Okay, the Bible introduces schooling as an at-home responsibility of the parent. Teach your children. Teach them diligently. Care for them. Um, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. I've chosen him that he may direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing the righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what is has promised, what what he has promised him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established a law in Israel, which would command our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. So look, if you don't have kids right now, you still have a responsibility. If, if you're not married, if you're single, it don't matter what context you're in, this is, this is to the people of God. We have an opportunity if, to educate children and we need to get closer. We have those. I know we got cousins, nieces, nephews. Somebody needs somebody to help them. And their tutor or so-called teacher may not be doing the job. But guess what? Instead of complaining about the school, as tendency of all of us, we, got, we have to step up and, and, and help out our younger people as much as we can. If that means we need to study up a little bit on algebra or Literally, just talk to them about Christ. And can't, I know you can read your ABCs, but can you read, can you read Genesis 1? You know? Um, Timothy, the great example, from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Um, so this is my last slide. Teaching children at home is the fundamental center of learning for the child. So they can read, they can read scripture, they can write, they can write about the Lord. Music, they can worship the Lord and help others do the same. Sciences, so they can better know the creator of, of creation. Art, so they can produce works that bring glory to God. History, so they can learn about our Christian heritage and sacrifice many were willing to make to freely worship God. Okay, we... Now we're at Q and A now, but um, are y'all? Do y'all still see? Um, I'm trying to get out of sharing my screen. I'm, I'm gonna make a. Uh, we we don't see the PowerPoint. I'm gonna make you uh, make you host again. So I know we covered a lot, but it's Q and A time. You know, uh, you know, we got <clears throat> got a little bit of time to talk. Um, but I just wanted to thank you guys for for supporting this project. Um, again, this is going to be an ebook, and we're going to dive a little deeper, but keep it concise. We don't want to just bore people with a bunch of stuff, a bunch of facts. Um, last thing, take the survey and I can email you guys a list of all the resources that were used in this project from 
the names, the places, the people, the books. If you want to read up on this yourself, um, it's all available. So, but I do appreciate you. And, you know, if you have any more questions to kind of, if you want nail, me to nail something down, um, you know, let's, let's, let's talk. Yeah, um, I, um, so, go ahead. Can you go ahead, Gabe. Go ahead, no, Gabe. no, go ahead. You good? Because yeah, I just had a statement. Okay. Um, so I was about to put this in the comments, but um, on a, on a like, um, I'm trying to set this up right. So you said Ritalin and how they were giving out kid, giving the kids, you know, like uh, I guess medicine to sit down or whatever. Man, that brought memories back because uh, I remember back to being in se second grade and um, I had an issue with, you know, sitting still and everything like that. Um, and um, like my mom, she, uh, um, you know, actually had to come up to the school a couple of times. You know, I was a terrible kid, I guess. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> so, so like, uh, <clears throat> Um, they were actually trying to convince her that I needed to be placed on placed on Ritalin um, to calm me down in class, um, and I was like, I was like, man, why would they? Why would they do that? Um, but it made me, it made me just, it brought that back to my mind, and I'm like, oh, no wonder, you know what I'm saying? Because it's right. it's like a, uh, um, you know, uh, I guess this is a part of this a, whole system that you're it, talking about. It's a sedative substance. It, it makes you, you know. It doesn't even make you willing to learn. It just makes you stop moving. <laughs> it just makes you stop moving. It's crazy, man. It's, yeah, uh, exactly. Um, but I mean, I didn't know how deep it it, it was. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Um, I was about to make it make it like a joke, but it's really not a joke. You know how many kids are being, uh, you know, I guess because they don't really fit that mold of the education right. system that we have. You know, they're exercised, they're ostracized, you know? Um, pretty crazy, bro. Yeah, man, thank you for sharing. Um, now, I was just gonna, um, I was saying that not only did uh, David Rockefeller um, have those statements, but he also uh, funded uh, women's lib liberation with the sole purpose of helping the woman leave the home to indoctrinate the children, so. I just want to throw that information out there. You can research that online <clears throat> as far as the indoctrination of children and things of that nature. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, um, like you said, Tony, I mean, it is a serious thing with medicating people for the purpose of making sure that they follow directions. Like, yeah. The Lord, right? The Lord's method of reaching the soul is because my, my child, my, my son asked me the other day, uh, what happens? <laughs> what happens if we just keep sinning? And I was like, well, if, if, if the Lord is really rooted in your heart, the tendency or the want or the desire to sin will decrease. If, he, if, if he's really yours, but God wants a, a, a will. He wants to see our will on display of the fact that we, we're not robots. And then when I said we're not robots, that he didn't, it triggered him to think about robots. Like, we're not really robots. I'm like, all right, yeah, I know we're not really robots, but <laughs> um, we're not robots. I'm saying he didn't make us to be people that operate as if we don't have a understanding. That's why he gives us understanding. And when you have understanding, you work willfully to, to pay attention. You don't have to be made to pay attention. You know, it, you know, and so, but you learn that over time. That's why in, in ancient Greece, when you have a classroom that's in a garden, you're not sitting at a desk. You know, you can sit down, there's places to sit. But when you're learning, you're, at, you're able to see, you're, you're able to be in front of nature. You're also able to run around if you have to. Exercise is really important to um, the Athenians. And, you know, I'm not saying that they're the, they're, the, they're the standard of education, but 
that's really the last time we have a vivid idea of understanding what education is outside of this mechanical, methodical way of, of learning that we've been accustomed to for so long, been literally programmed. So, um, you know, like you said, it's very serious and, and gay what you said about John D. Rockefeller. Um, yeah, I mean, these men that had these oil oil companies and, and J.P. Morgan and, uh, you know, a lot of these men, they put their money together for the purpose of controlling the population. It wasn't about, oh, look at how much money I got. Let me buy this. Right? They don't want to they don't care about buying stuff. They cared about power and control over people. So, and they had a lot of help, too. I just want to say Margaret Mead. Uh, Gregory Basin, a lot of these people were in charge of pushing, and Ever Renee's pushing to the pushing a lot of this propaganda through, through the movies as well. Because when Hollywood came into play, now you know to Ever Renee's, he's the one that came up with the term teenager. Mm. You know, uh, I we didn't even go over child labor laws and how the extension of childhood happened as well. Because initially the, uh, the the childhood age, you know, you you graduated at fourteen, but they pushed it four years more. They pushed it to eighteen. You know, Question. yeah. Um, I forget. Um, I was reading or studying something, and um, I basically came across like how the Sunday school method also played a role in our education system. Yeah, yeah, and okay. that goes back to the reformers, you know. Yeah, where it started. No, nah, right, nah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so, also, yeah. Do, another question: Do you think, um, uh, I guess, like how Tony was saying, how you know they prescribed him Ritalin or whatever? Like, do you think that? Try um, to man, try to, try to man. Try to. Oh, oh, <laughs> he didn't take it. He didn't take it. <laughs> oh, I didn't take it, man. <laughs> and he did you man. think and he that's just a method of like um <laughs> i guess drugging up kids so that later on in life they'll be used to taking pharmaceuticals do, do you think that there's a absolutely for that absolutely see now you're opening up the box man we we're supposed to just stay on education now you're opening up the box Cause it's gonna, it, it's. I'm telling you, it's, it's something that has so many trails to it. Think about it. If you're gonna control the population with education, you have to also control the population with healthcare. And if you control the population with education and healthcare, then you have to control the population. Uh, if it, if it's universal schooling, there has to be universal healthcare, right? They go hand in hand. So. If people are on the drugs, we talk about the war on drugs and the infiltration of heroin and all that stuff. You want to go all that, all down that whole path of stuff, opium and I mean, ugh, that's a drugs is a is just a crazy story. Everybody got so many stories on it. Like there's so many stories in so many countries. But what it comes down to is, if you have a universal school and universal healthcare, how do you get dependent people? in the healthcare system. Well, they have to be medicated. If anybody steps out of line of what they're supposed to do in school, they'll be medicated. What's gonna happen to that medicated child? They're gonna get addicted to the medication. They don't even know why. They're gonna find some kind of medication compatible. Well, guess what? If the government is bringing in drugs as well, and there's legal drugs, well, I mean, you got a problem, Come on to the doctor's office because it's it's not it's not helping you. It's actually hurting you. So there you go. It, it become they become a, a victim of the system. And what are the other side effects? Now we're not blaming sin on the government. We're just saying that there's a, a easy access to sin with what we have in, in, in this world. And if a person acts out of line with the drugs, typically they get violent. You know. And right. what do we do with violent people? Well. Then you're gonna open up that box of the prison industrial complex, and now we're gonna now we're gonna be here till like three in the morning. So it, it's not only yeah. that because I've I've actually heard uh, people say um, that when those kids take I don't know what it what it is it's like a drug it's like 
it's almost like a shell of themselves. Like they just sit there and they just look completely docile. Like, I don't know. Uh, like, and I hear the same as far as like when people who take like antidepressants, like as far as like when they, when they take stuff to help them to settle down, like yeah. they're more compliant and just, I don't know. It's like, they're not natural. So right, I don't, right. I don't that out there. Absolutely. And you know, I mean that's that's just the point. It drives home the point that institutionalism, we're talking about the season fruit of institutional suppression. Things that have been buried under bodies that's in the closet, stuff that's under the rug, that only a person that pursues wisdom without caring about what people think or caring about what they may they may find um, you go. It, it's, it's going to be an opportunity to really see what's going on. Now, the thing is, educate your children at home. That's our whole. That's really our whole premise. But there's so many layers of why that's important that make this lesson that, that make this project something that is not just something to uh, share for informational purposes. It's literally something that I pray will open up the hearts and minds of those that have been blinded for so long. Especially our parents' generation. Our parents' generation, especially. <laughs> they still um, go no. to the... Do, do you think that parents about, today... Oh, well, go ahead, Tony. No, go ahead, go ahead. Now, do you think that parents today rely too much and too heavily on the educational system? It's kind of like, all right, <clears throat> there's Johnny, and really don't put too much thought into it. Like, what's your? I just want your opinion as far as that. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think uh, our our education system has been so well marketed that when you don't investigate anything, you just kind of keep it. You know, well, hey, you go to school, you get a good education, you get a job. You know, you get a job, you take care of your family. Hey, you you done you done your job. You done what you do. Me, son. <laughs> <laughs> so when when you when you're dealing with um, when you're dealing with that mindset, then yeah, I mean, there's a heavy dependence on if this is the place that they say it is. Then you know, by all means, you know, go to school, get an education. It, it's gonna be. It's not like they're intentionally. Um, okay, it's it's it's, it's not going to be an intentional uh, investigation. It's just going to be a kind of a, a passe, passive, just a uh, face value. Yeah, face value. Yeah. Tony, what what were you going to say? And we got like ten minutes left, so if anybody else might have. Um, I was going to say I had one question, then I had a statement. Um, so I'm going to ask my question first. Do you think that, um, because we talked about terrorism, right? The word of terrorism back in 2000. Um, and then shortly after terrorism was the word social media came about, right? Mm. Do you think, social and then media. now we see social media, we, we could have never imagined, you know, um, how, bad social media has gotten as far as being you know whether it's censoring whether it's selling people's data whether it's you know um, i mean literally we could look at china right now and you know they use all of these methods on their on their people um would you would you consider that um the new i say let's say like rockefeller and you know um the new monopolies you know they're gonna be making yeah, more games uh, monopolies it's, you know it's what I'm all it is. All it is is just the same thing with a new package. You know, yeah. we got the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and the J.P. Morgans of old. Now we got the Zuckerbergs and the uh, the Bill Gates and the um, you know a couple of you know. I guess you got to throw for the health the, for the health conscious folks. You got to throw in this new. Uh, uh, I mean, he's not even new. He's been around for a while, but Dr. Fa Fauci. Um, you know, yeah. So it's like um, same agenda, new new faces, 
but the same agenda. Like, so yeah, social media is another form of control. It's a form of social control. It's, it's uh, be who you are and tell us everything. Tell us everything you of who you are. You know, it's your page, but it's, it's our system. You know, it's, right. <laughs> it's your page. You know, people get real, real buck about their, their social media. Like, yeah, this is, it's my page. This is this is this is this is my this is my world right here. And, and, and all they're doing is feeding a machine that is recording everything they're doing and saying and wherever they're going. And if any of where they go or what they say presents a threat, then they'll be silenced. They'll wonder why they're not making any more money on YouTube. They'll wonder why, you know, um, they can't log in or stuff is called you know like now you know you put a certain post up they'll say oh this is fake news or whatever so yeah and then uh that was a, thank you james yeah. a, and then uh my second comment before um melissa goes was that i think that you know due to the coronavirus um going back to the whole um you know um, how really you had it in your presentation, how originally, you know, the par it was the parents' job to take care of the kids. It was the parents' job to teach the kids. And I feel like with the coronavirus, how that, how that has affected our, you know, our, our, let's say our culture, you know, people that, you know, believers, you know, having to sort of like be forced into that, you know, um, in a, in a certain way, you know, not, you know, cause they're still, they're still at, they're still, you know, um, online school and whatever, but I'm saying like, be more involved with their kids, you know, um, rather than sending them off to, uh, um, um, you know, private, school, no, not private school, but public school. But I, I and I'm gonna just throw this question in real quick. Um, so oh, do you well, think that- Well, remember Melissa has a few comments too before we- uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so go ahead, go ahead, Melissa. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Now, hey. Just go ahead and we'll, we'll do a little over, you know, just make sure everybody get their point across because it's just the four of us. So just go ahead. That's cool. Okay. Um, if you mind sending me that link from James, if you have the ability to do that. Yeah, I'll just put it in there. I can't save it. Um, oh, okay. I'm going to put it directly. I'm going to send it directly to you. Maybe you can okay. take it from there. Um, but I had a few comments to make and... I actually was taking notes because some of this stuff is really oh, interesting to me. Um, Tony's comment about the ADHD medications, I had the exact same thing happened to me with my um, oldest daughter. She was in school. They told me several times about, um, they weren't allowed to talk to me about medication, but they talked to me about it as much as humanly possible without actually telling me to put her on medication because she was talkative and disruptive and whatnot um so they talked to me about the adhd and i ended up after a long time of refusing to comply i finally ended up putting her on the medication just because it was an ongoing problem with the teachers and they were really not nice to her um and dealing with her um about the guy that said that he basically wanted mind control or the kids is kind of how I took it, about the children being the responsibility of the state instead of the parents. Um, there's actually a Harvard summit that's anti, it goes against the homeschooling um, and they teach the dangers of parents being able to educate their own children. I don't know if you guys have heard that, but Harvard Can you, has, that link? Can you put a link of that in the- oh, um, I'll try I'm to find in. something to share, but I'd heard about it in this last year that Harvard actually has a summit that's like, I don't know what it's called, but it's an anti-homeschool summit to try to limit the ability for parents to homeschool their own kids. Um, I think the left really worry about the control that parents have over their kids, and they worry that if parents homeschool that they'll have more of an input into their kids' lives. Um, I also was finding the last part of what he was going over, it kept coming into my mind. Hey, Melissa. You Sorry, my me. son muted me. <laughs> um, it seems like the way that it became so institutionalized, it really reminded me even of the abortion. How, if you research anything about abortion and how it became institutionalized and it became something um, 
that was government promoted um, fell under the umbrella of like this falls under the umbrella of a school educating system and abortion seems to fall under the umbrella of health care. I, I don't know if you guys see the parallel yeah, at all, yeah. but it, it kind of came to me that it yes. seems like there's something there to me. Um, no, I mean, that's facts. So you're on, you're on point. I mean, James, like, yeah, like that's facts. Yeah, yeah, like uh, the abortion, the abortion uh, situation from, from a Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood, it, they got funded. They got funded by uh, some of the same people that were funding everything else. These private organizations, um, you know, like for instance, back on in my single days, I remember when um, I had talked to a few girls that went to Spelman, and um, one of them said that um, she was able to get a free abortion. And I'm like, how? She was like, oh. Cause all I gotta do is just ask my administrator, and they give us, they give us, a, they can give us a, a, a voucher. Oh my god! Yeah, so it's like it's connected. It's definitely connected. It's 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 a it's part of the system yeah. of population control. So yeah. Um, the last thing was we talked about the truancy and with the strict regulation with that. Um, I'm in Pennsylvania and she, my daughter actually went through a Christian residential um, program because of her rebellion issues um, and there was another family that was there because the dad almost went to jail because of and he had to go to court several times because his daughter was skipping school and she there, it ended up being a criminal matter that the dad was having to go to court um, to try to stay out of jail for his daughter's truancy. Um, and Pennsylvania is one of the strictest school, one of the strictest states for homeschooling. There go, there are some states that have no oversight and Pennsylvania, unfortunately, is one of the strictest um, in the whole country. And it just, they want control of the kids. <laughs> I mean, they, they'll say it's for the well-being and whatnot, but they go a little bit too far because they want the control over the curriculum and things like that. Yep. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, the first person that popped up in my head was uh, Margaret Saget when he was talking about abortion. Um, I mean, yeah. literally, she was a part of a long line of people who believed in this utopian, um, utopian, you know, um, like, society of one race, you know, like, uh, you know, one supreme race, you know, or something like that. Um, with a bunch of other people, um, eugenics, and, you know, yeah, eugenics, yeah. Um, they, they, uh, uh, call their, they, you know, it's different names now, you know, that they call that they call themselves. Um, but I mean, like they all, it all ties in. I would, um, I know this is this is, I know I talk about communism a lot, and I'm and I'm not trying to be political or like think about a economic like. Just thinking economically at all the time, but I don't know if y'all have y'all ever seen the specter of communism. No, I haven't. Because this is movie that talks about. Um, I would recommend it. Um, you know, it has a segment on the specter of communism um, in the education, uh, um, like from the education no standpoint. Um, as well but like like what james was saying um i mean literally like everything plays into you know one another ties into one another you know um the abortion thing all of that stuff so yeah yeah i, I think it's i think it's beautiful that james spent the last two sundays talking about you know education and you know training kids and they come in singing the ABC song. I, I think that's 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 <laughs> beautiful, man. <laughs> They're like A B. <laughs> yeah. uh, so a dad that loves his kids, man. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's. I think that's. that's I think real. that's rich, man. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, like, uh, like, yeah. I, I appreciate. I appreciate the opportunity. I knew that. 
one day this this project was gonna get off the ground a little bit and I didn't know when. I mean, I've sat on this for a little while, picked it back up, sat on it again. But it's um, you know, after having kids and seeing what's going on just with my own eyes, it's just like, man, you know what, like. What am I doing sitting on this again? Like I got this, I gotta get this up. Like, because, you know, even Pastor Pat, like, you know, I transitioned to a new church and he um, you know, he's been supportive over a lot of things I've done, but we've kind of lost a little bit of our momentum with this. And so, you know, it really took a a biblical effort. I take I give God the glory on everything because obviously uh a lot of this stuff. Thank God for the internet, <laughs> because, you know, I realized this stuff, I would have had to go up to places like Pennsylvania. I would have had to go and travel to find these documents and put on some glasses and pretend to be some inspector or something. I would have, like, it, it would have been so crazy to get this information in, in my hands if it wasn't for um, just the access with being online. So um, God is good. You can use it for good or you can use it for evil. And I just thank you. Thank you guys to allow me to, to be on here. And fighting to defend the gospel. Gospel, yeah. Fighting to defend the gospel, yeah. Fighting to defend the Bible, yeah.